changes things around now, flips around and says, So then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except to the Jews alone. And to bring you up to snuff on that, Stephen in chapter 7 was stoned to death for sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, for sharing the good news of who Jesus was. They killed him. And Paul, who becomes Paul, who was Saul at the time, was in hardly agreement of that. And then he got saved on the road to Damascus. We saw that. And so there, because of that, and they, here they saw one of their own get killed for sharing Jesus. They were split and they, were, they started to spread out. A good way for the Holy Spirit to get them to, to use Stephen's life to get them to go to different parts of the world to share the gospel because they might have just stayed in that one place except for persecution, so they started running. But these guys were only sharing with the Jews. They were still in that mindset that Gentiles were just fueled for the fires of hell. But then verse 20 it says, But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus. So were those that had understanding that God loved everybody, and so they you know, would share Jesus. And what happened then in verse 21 we see, And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. They went beyond their thinking, beyond their selves, beyond their culture, and shared Jesus with everyone. And guess what? People got saved. You know, in, the, in verse um, 19, we don't see anybody getting saved, but we see when this next group shows up and shares with the Gentiles, the Gentiles are getting saved. Not putting God in a box. And it says there in 21, it says, And though in a large number who believed turned to the Lord. You notice there it says, first they believed, and then they turned to the Lord. You know the scripture of James where it says, well, even the demons believe, and they shudder, they shake in fear. They're not saved. People can believe in Jesus and not be saved, because they haven't turned their life over to Him. They haven't been born again. But many people go to church aren't going to heaven, you know. I hate to say that, but it's the truth. There will be many standing before Jesus. And he says, I never knew you. But, but, but I gave in church. And I did this. And I did. I never knew you. They can believe. See, there's a, it's believing with your whole heart. Believing. Trusting in him. With your life. With your salvation. Knowing that he is God. We must fully surrender and trust in him with our hearts. Fully. Well, in verse 22 of Acts chapter 11, it then says, The news about them reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem. You know, the word travels fast. People are getting saved over in Antioch, man. They're getting saved there now. And their Gentiles are getting saved. And that news reached them. And so they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. Barnabas. His name means son of encouragement. Barnabas, the one who encourages. He doesn't tear down and put people down. He encourages people. He's the one that brought uh, Saul to Jerusalem, to the church. And people are freaking out. Wait a minute, Saul's having us killed. What are you bringing him here for? But Barnabas, encouragement. He's the one who brought Saul in. And so, it says there in verse 23, Then when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. In other words, he's saying, believe with your whole heart. With your heart, believe. Not just your mind. With your heart. With your, the, the purpose of your heart. It is your heart. He exhorts them to hang on to Jesus. You wonder, well, why is the Lord so interested in the heart? Because you know what? We change our minds very easily. Our intellect. We change our minds. I mean, if you don't believe that, just if you ever go out to eat somewhere and you're looking at the menu, and you go, oh, I'm going to have this. And then a minute later you say, have this. And when the waitress or waiter comes up, then you change it again. You change it sometimes three or four times before you even order. We change our minds quickly. So easily. 
hundred times a day we change our mind. But your heart takes a long time to heal. It gets set in something and then it, especially when it gets broken, it takes a long time to heal. You see, if my faith was best, you know, based on my intellect, then I go back and forth all the time. Is it true? Is it not true? Is it true? Is it? How can that be? How can somebody come out of the grave? That doesn't make any sense at all. Nobody can come back to life, you know. And with our intellect, we can think of those things. With our intellect, we can say, "How could Jesus be God?" When it says He's the Son of God, and our intellect just—it's our heart. We lean with our whole heart. That Jesus Christ went to the cross and shed his blood for our sin and rose from the dead. Man, you will be saved. You will be saved. Confess him with your mouth. Jesus is Lord. You will be saved. So here we have Barnabas on the scene now. And I love what the Lord, the Lord says about Barnabas in verse 24. He says, for he was a good man. And full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And considerable numbers were brought to the Lord. Because he was full of faith. And he was a good man in the Lord. And so many people got saved. You know, tell me something there. You know, if we really walk with Jesus, if we follow the Lord, God will use us to touch other people's lives. Oh, that doesn't mean hundreds are going to come to the Lord because you're going to walk down the street and there's going to be a glow around people. Oh, Jesus, you know. But he'll use you in the ways that he, he made you to be used. Do you want to be used by God? Do you want to be a man of God? You know, when I say man, I also mean woman too. Man or woman, okay? Nowadays, you've got to clarify it or you know you're whatever you are. You can be anything. There's some character, there are a lot of characteristics of a man who God uses. And Pastor Chuck Smith did a study one time on the 14 characteristics, characteristics of a man of God. And I'm not doing that study today because you wouldn't get to lunch. But you see, we're in a battle every day between two forces, between the spirit and the flesh. And it's a war. I am const I know that I'm constantly in a battle with the spirit and the flesh in my own life. And I assume that you are too. And if you don't aren't aware of it, get aware of it. If you're not aware, it's probably because you're walking in the flesh. Listen to what it says in Galatians 5, 19 through 23. It says, Now the deeds of the flesh are evident which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like this of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. All of, and there's so much in those things that are flesh in our lives. And it says there, those who practice such things, that doesn't mean if you stumble and you fall, you're going to hell. I mean, I mean, what what kind of a life would it be that every time you stumbled and fell, you thought you were going to hell? Man, that's, that's, not, that's not compassion from Jesus. You stumble and you fall, you get up and you turn. Lord, forgive me. Help me not to do that again or whatever, you know? But it continues on in the scripture that most of us hear most of the time and we love. Galatians 5, 22 through 25 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Does that sound like anybody you know? <laughs> Jesus. Don't, don't answer that question. Because with Jesus in your life, you can have those qualities in your life. And if you have those qualities in your life, it's probably because you have Jesus in your life. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. You see, when we received the Lord, and we, we were born again, when the Lord really came and lived in our lives, 
The flesh was crucified. The thing is, is we need to walk in it. To walk in the victory that He provided for us. And not give in to the flesh. And sometimes, I mean, I remember my earlier days. I remember the days before I really started walking with the Lord, but I knew who the Lord was. And I was in the flesh all the time, and I, and I didn't want to be, and I didn't know how to stop it. I was doing things I really didn't want. I knew were wrong, and I didn't really want to do them, but man, I just couldn't stop it. I was, I was you know, I was, I was just caught. I was a slave to those things in my life. And it was so hard. And God wasn't using me. Even though I knew the Lord. Yeah, I'm sure he used me a little bit when I, you know, because I believed in him, but I wasn't out sharing him. You know, it says, that the Bible says we can disqualify ourselves. I think it's talking about disqualifying ourselves to be used by the Lord. It says in 1 Corinthians 9, 27. Paul speaking says, but I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified. He disciplines his body. You know, that, that's the battle between the spirit and the flesh. Our flesh is so wicked. you got to fight. It's not easy to do good, to be good, is it? Seems like some, you know, sometimes maybe it is, but for some of you, but it's hard. To continue on that walk. The flesh just wants to do this and wants to do that. And sadly, many have disqualified themselves from the ministry for letting the flesh win the battle. But there are some things to be that man of God. And I'm just, I just want to speak of three of them today. And the first one I want to talk about is prayer. To be a man or a woman of prayer, speaking to the Lord talking to him continually all day. That doesn't mean you run around on your knees, you know, and you know, it'll be all holy and you're all you know, you know, it's just that communion with God during the day. Just acknowledge him that he's there with you because he is. He's with us all of the time. He is with you more than anybody. He's always there. I love the psalmist says in Psalm 141 verse 2 says, May my prayer be counted as incense before you. The lifting of my hands is the evening offering. It is prayer be counted as incense. See incense around the throne, blessing the Lord, worshiping the Lord with incense. And our prayers be around the throne. Continually. So if there are things that can disqualify us. There are things that can help us to be used by God, and prayer is one. Remember Peter and John, when they encountered the lame, lame man at the gate? What were they doing? Acts 3.1 says this, Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer. See, they had a set time where they would go and pray every day. Every day, spending that time praying. To the Lord. Consistent time in prayer. And Paul, he many times said he prayed for people day and night. Now let me give you some basic little keys, elements of prayer. Some basic things. And it comes out of the Lord's Prayer. You don't have to just say the Lord's Prayer exactly the way it, it's stated there. But it's it gives us the, the idea of how to pray. And so, number one thing is this. Relationship. Our Father. See, He is our Father. When you start to, how do you start your prayer off? Dear Lord. Or our Father. Or Jesus. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father who is in heaven. You've got a relationship with Him. The Creator of the universe. The Creator of all things. You have a personal relationship with Him. Just think about that. God, who set the stars in their place, who said, let there be light, you know, which we're going to look at uh, this Wednesday, yeah, Wednesday night. Let there be light. And there was light. He spoke things into existence. 
wants a relationship with you, and you have a relationship with him. It's just a matter of acknowledging him, speaking to him, our Father, and then worshiping him in your prayer. Holy is thy name. Hallowed be thy name. Holy Lord, you are awesome. You are great and wonderful. You are like, like we came here this morning. And first we prayed to him, right? And that's how we started off. And then what do we do? We worship him. And I don't know about you, but when I worship the Lord, the things of the earth go strangely dim. And it just puts my mind on the things of the Lord. It helps me to focus on what I'm going to teach. But when I would go to church before I was a pastor, it it just got my mind off the things that I was dealing with in this life. And I was able to receive what the Lord had for me in His Word. And I wasn't all stressed. You know, how, you know how it is. I, you know, I know in the States it was this way. I mean, people come to church, you know, and man, they're fighting with each other. And they're yelling at the kids. And they're late. And they're doing this and they did that. And they're mad at this. And they come to the front door of the church and they go, good morning. <laughs> How are you doing? Oh, I'm great. I mean, kind of real life. Number one, the enemy doesn't want you to go to church, so he's going to do whatever he can to stop you. All those little things you think that your family's doing, or this is in the way, or that, you know, or she's combing her hair still, put on the makeup, or you know, or whatever. <laughs> Get out of the bathroom. Yeah, you know, you got to go. All, all that stuff. And then you start to worship. And you forget, forget about it. I mean, hopefully you do. And you're thinking of the Lord. And you're hopefully blessing Him. Man, it just prepares your heart. Worshiping Him. Focusing on His character. Worshiping Him for His mighty works. Worshiping Him for who He is. Because He's great and awesome. And then after that, confession. The Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And that's usually my first prayer in the morning. Lord, cleanse me. Show me if there's anything in my life I need to confess to you so I can be get right before you. There's nothing worse for me as a pastor to have something in my life that's interfering with my walk with the Lord, coming up here and trying to teach, and here I am in the middle of teaching, and that thought will pop in my brain. So I get rid of it. You've got to take care of it earlier. The thought tries to pop up in the name of Jesus rebuke you. Say, get away. Get those thoughts away. And turn right back to the Lord. Forgive us. As we forgive others. Important part. Forgiving others. You know, yes, he died once and for all. Once and for all. But he still asks us to confess our sins to him. Now, if you miss one, you're not going to hell, okay? Lord, forgive me of my sins. You know, the ones that come to my mind are just in all of them. And you know what? He is such a loving God. He does that faithfully for us. What did he say in 1 John 1, 9? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then that will restore your fellowship with the Lord and with the Father. It was hindered by sin, that restores it. Right then and there. Boom. Done deal. And then, petition. Ask Him. Lord, give us this day our daily bread. Take care of us today, Lord. Give us what we need, Lord. And you bring your request to Him then. See, you've been cleansed. You've worshipped Him. Then you come with, Lord, help And then interceding for others. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And pray for others. Pray for their, their relationship with the Lord. Pray for the things they're going through in their life. And intercede for other people. Go beyond ourselves. Take your prayers beyond yourself. And pray for others. You know when you do that, your life will be much better. Because your eyes will be on other people and on God's work and they're not on yourself. Because when you, your eyes are on yourself, you're going to be bummed, guaranteed. So prayer is very important. And secondly, faith. Having faith. 
in the Lord. In that same scripture we looked at when we talked about Peter where they went to pray. He had faith. He had faith in the Lord. It says in Acts 3, 6 and 7, it said, But Peter said to the man who was sitting by the gate, it was lame, he said, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene. And seizing him by the hand, he raised him up and immediately his feet and ankles were strengthened. Peter had the faith to reach down to a lame man who couldn't walk and pick him up. That could have been a disaster. Oh, I've seen a disaster right here in this village. Miss Anna and Mr. Kerwin and I, years ago, at, at a faith healing meeting where the lady was in a wheelchair and they were trying to get her to make her stand up and, oh, and for hours and it didn't happen. Because they had the wrong faith. They had faith in faith and not in God who gives faith. So Peter had this faith that this man will walk. And he used the name of Jesus. You see in John 14, Jesus said, verse 12 through 14, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. Is that a, that's a cool statement, isn't it? He, he tells you and I that the things that he did, we will do greater things because he goes to the Father and intercedes for us. That he's going to work through us. It's not going to be us. It's the faith in him that does those works through us. Greater works. Whoa. That's another study. I'm not going there. And then he goes on to say, Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Oh, wow. In the name of Jesus, give me $5 million. No. <laughs> in his name means his will. Along his will, his character. And it's it asking for five million dollars or two million dollars is your flesh. I've done it before. <laughs> Knowing I wasn't gonna get it, but I, I said, Lord, Lord, you said I have not because I asked not, can you give me a million dollars? He didn't. Because my motives were totally wrong and I knew it, but I asked him here. Could you Please plant a money tree in my backyard that grew 100s, not ones. Never happened. See, it's, it's faith in the Lord that healed that man. It wasn't Peter. It wasn't Peter's faith. faith. It was the faith that the Lord gave him that healed that man. He goes on to say in Acts 3, verse 16, later on when he's explaining what happened, he said... And on the basis of faith in his name, it is the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man whom you see and know. And the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all. It's the faith that God gave Peter. And the man was healed. And remember that when you pray for someone. That it, he can do it. It's the faith he gives you. But it's just not in healing, but in, in just in life. In faith of getting, in, getting you through the next day. Faith that Jesus is who he says he is. Faith that Jesus is coming back. Faith that your sins are forgiven. It's faith. Because I don't know about you, but I never saw Jesus. He never appeared to me, although I asked him to one time. He said, if you really want me to do that, I'm not moving unless you appear to me. Well, he didn't. And I did it anyhow because I knew he was telling me to do it. You see, the work of the Spirit is done not by my will, but His will. So you have prayer, faith, and the third thing, the last one I want to look at is the Word of God. God's Word. Be a man or a woman of God's Word. Know His Word. Because you see, the Bible says, that heaven and earth will pass away, but not his word. That doesn't mean his book. Yeah, it's going to burn. But his word goes on forever. I find very interesting that in, in uh, John chapter 1, that the word is Jesus. He is God. The word is God. And the word is Jesus. You see, after that miracle that Peter did, all was a part of, 
The explanation comes straight from the Word. It says, Acts 3.18 says, But the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets that is, that is Christ would suffer, He is thus fulfilled. And in verse 21 it says, Whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke of by the mouth of the holy prophets from ancient times. Because it, God's word had spoke about the things that were happening there with Peter in the gate and the healing. And it's spoken of in the Old Testament. And that God's word has come true. Just like the Old Testament prophecies and the New Testament prophecies are coming true right before our eyes today. Which we looked at for almost a whole year, didn't we? Going through Revelation and, and uh, uh, Thessalonians and looking at what's going on in the world today and what's happening. And fulfillment of prophecy right before our eyes. You see, many churches today don't believe and they don't stand on the Word of God. They're, many of them are run by feelings and experience. Well, it felt good. It must have been the Lord. Well, I don't know about that. There's a lot of things that feel good that aren't of the Lord. Matter of fact, sin feels pretty good. Matter of fact, you know, we do sin because it's fun. We don't sin because it hurts. It hurts later. That's why God doesn't want us to do it. But sin is fun. But why would you do it? The problem is, it hurts later. It's bad. So we don't want to be run by feelings. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Right here. Here's how God honors His Word. Psalm 138, verse 2. I will bow down towards your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your loving kindness and your truth, for you have magnified your word according to your name. God loves his word. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2 through 4, an exhortation to us, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Rebuke, exhort, reprove with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. And will turn their ears away from truth and will turn aside to myths. And we have that happening in our world today, big time. If it's not here, you don't need it. That doesn't mean some things that aren't here aren't okay. But you know what? I didn't want to go there. I don't even need to go there. If it's not here, I don't need it. There's so much here for me for lifetimes. If I live more than one lifetime, for lifetimes to learn and to know. So you want to be used by God? Pray. Have faith in the Lord. Spend time in the Word. What we see here is in Acts chapter 11, back to Acts chapter 11, that the order of ministry that's done in Antioch, number one, there was preaching. You know, bringing the good news, that's in verse 20. In verse 23, there's encouragement and exhortation. That's a good order for us to follow. Those things there. In verse 24, once again, for he was a good man, talking about Barnabas. And full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and considerable numbers were brought to the Lord because of his life. And in verse 25, it says, and he left for Tarsus to look for Saul. See, he left and he went to Tarsus because about eight to ten years later, he took, because remember Saul, we looked at him going through Acts. He caused much stink. People were trying to kill him everywhere. His problems were happening everywhere he went. So Barnabas took him, to, he took him home to his hometown and left him there. And it's been eight or ten years that Paul, who was Saul at that time, was being ministered to from the Lord and studying the scriptures and getting ready for big time ministry. And that's what we're going to see as we go through the book of Acts. It says, the, and it says there that he went to look for him. And when it, the word look there is more than just look. It's like when Mary and Joseph lost Jesus, their son, they lost him. Remember, where's Jesus? I mean, they lost him for a few days, right? They went to look for him. You know, if a parent loses a kid, how do you look? You look. And that's what Barnabas is doing. He's looking for Saul. He really searched for him. Because he knew that Saul was anointed by God. And so then, in verse 26, And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. 
And for an entire year, they met with the church and taught considerable numbers. And the, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. You ever want to know where the where the word Christian came from? Well, Antioch. That's where they call Christians. And it, it means little Christ. To follow Jesus. Okay? And so wrapping this up this morning, verse 27 through 30. Now at this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and began to indicate by the Spirit that there would be certainly be a great famine all over the world. And this took place in the reign of Claudius. And in the proportion that any of the disciples had means, each of them determined to send a contribution for the relief of the brethren living in Judea. And this they did, sending in charge of Barnabas and Saul to the elders. So there, there was this famine coming, and the prophets stood up and said, Hey, let's take an offering and help. That's a good thing to do. A biblical way of helping people is to give, to take care of other people. Winston Churchill, a leader years ago, he said this, We make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. And it's the truth. It's, there's truth in that statement right there. So when times were tough in the early church, what can we do to help? How can we give to help this situation out? And you know what? It's not, not any different today. And we've had this past year some really hard times come upon people with COVID-19 and the shutdown of our country here and the shutdown of other countries. And it has been really, really a hard time. And what I've seen during that for this last year, starting in February of last year, when we had a, a fire right back over here, 14 families lost their homes, 14 homes gone in a matter of an hour. I saw the church come together and give and help the people. That, and, and yes, other people did too, but I'm just going to talk, just look, you know, the church, what can we do to help? I had people contacted me on the internet. What can we do to help? And people would send money and, and we would be able to get by things. I mean, one lady we were able to buy a refrigerator for her. And, and other people in the community that were Christians came together to help. And then right after that, within a few weeks, we had the big COVID thing and things started shutting down. The next thing you know, food's getting short for people. People all lost their jobs. It was a hard time. And I saw the church again. What can we do to help? And pooling the resources and the money, putting it together to feed people in St. Mike. I saw the church do it was a huge part of feeding the people in St. Mike for the last year. And not just our church fellowship, but other uh, people from the from the states that had come here, they helped also to help feed this community. I, I don't know if they were the biggest part, but they were a big part in that. And I see what the word says is not just for them, but it's for now also. And to, and to be a part of it and live it and see that the church is still functioning like the church. What a blessing. And a blessing to be a part of it. You see, God was moving there in Antioch. He was moving. And guess what? God is moving in Sabite. God is moving on this peninsula also. Just like in Sabite. I mean, just like in Antioch. It's a matter of, do we want to be a part of that work? How do we become a part of that work? Surrender to the Lord. Surrender. 100% of your life. Don't hold anything back. You want them to use you 1% or you want them to use you 100%? Surrender. Follow Him. Deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow Jesus. And watch what He does. Watch, watch what He does in your life. Watch what He does in those you come in contact with through your life. Because see, that's what life is all about. We're not here that long. I've been thinking about that a lot lately. Oh, I saw we have a new chiropractor in town, Mr. Chris here. And, and I got an adjustment for him when I was in Spanish from him when I was in Spanish lookout. And, and he said, and he made a statement to me while I was there. He says, he says, You're in pretty good shape. 
for an old guy. <laughs> he didn't say that part. But I knew what he was saying. And I started thinking, well, I'm going to be 70 years old. How did that happen? I was just, you know, Miss Anna and I were in our 20s the other day, you know, hanging out together, having a good old time. Years and years of sharing Jesus on the road, doing concerts, and here we are. At the other end. And the difference in our life was we surrendered into Jesus. And I tell you, we're not any different than anybody else. There was nothing special at all. Matter of fact, we were the lowest of low. Probably the least to succeed in life from our high school days. That's what they would say about us. And we look what Jesus did. And he can do it through you also. Surrender. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the encouragement of your word. Thank you, Lord, that you want to use us. So help us, Lord. Help us to surrender those things in our life, to lay our whole lives down before you, to walk with you in a deep, intimate way. And then use us, Lord. We want to see people know you. It's the end days, Lord. We want to see people saved, come to that knowledge of who you are, and to walk with you and be blessed by you, Lord. So use us. Use us. And help us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.